Welcome to Frontier Trading Company. Today I am at Independence Hall, the building in Philadelphia where both the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution were debated and ratified. The political actions that happened here on this ground established the foundation of America. And on an even larger scale, these actions have largely been the cause of the rapid change that our world has experienced over the past 245 years. The city of Philadelphia has undergone that same change and has grown in densely around these historic sites, bringing the noise and the bustle of modern life not 100 feet from where I'm standing right now. And all that growth forced me to pick up this video in a nearby colonial style garden. I really wanted to complete this whole video in front of Independence Hall, but after a few hours of competing with the noises of the city, a fleet of lawnmowers came in and beat me out. Philadelphia has grown up, but it's also retained much of its 18th century charm, and the National Park Service maintains some beautiful gardens surrounding Independence Hall. You can still hear the noises of the city here, but I hope it's not as distracting. Of course, there are hundreds of engaging topics to be discussed here at Independence Hall. But today I would like to talk about the impact that the Declaration of Independence had on the frontier territories many miles away, a subject largely untouched by historians who would rather focus on more dramatic engagements within the established colonies in the East. The Declaration itself makes mention of the frontier only once. As you will recall, it is in the fifth and final grievance addressed by the colonists. Jefferson writes that King George has, quote, excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. We now know, looking back, that those who did live along the frontier experienced the raw effects of this document, and all politics, really. It was experienced by young men in uniform taking bullets on the battlefields of the eastern United States, sure. But it was experienced even more brutally by the men, women, and children, entire families, who had experienced the exact language set forth in the Declaration, that being an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So let me lay the groundwork for that destruction. You've probably read that most frontiersmen were indifferent to the knowledge that a revolutionary war had been declared. Now, this might be true in the sense that folks on the frontier didn't flock east to join into the fighting, but they certainly were not indifferent to the effect that it had on the British and their native allies. And that's the real focus of revolutionary wartime interest along the frontier. The relationships between the British, American Indians, and colonial frontier settlers are complicated and deep-seated. The close of the French and Indian War brought the removal of France and her Native American allies, who had hemmed in the British along the frontier, preventing westward expansion. It was thought to be a great victory by the commoners, who knew that they had secured a future on that distant territory of unlimited resources and freedom. But not long after, the British issued the Proclamation of 1763, which forbade British colonists from settling west of the Appalachian Mountains. The colonists who had fought over that wilderness weren't about to be told that they couldn't go into it to settle the land that they had lost brothers, fathers, cousins, and uncles over. It was this gross injustice. But the Proclamation of 1763 was also a stroke of genius on behalf of Great Britain because it was meant to prevent tensions between colonists and the tribes beyond the Appalachians while the colonies stabilized after the conflict. The protest over this policy was so strong, though, that in 1768, Britain pursued the Treaty of Fort Stanwix and the Treaty of Hard Labor, which opened up land for settlement south of the Ohio River. What the British did not realize during this period of deregulation was that the tribes who supposedly sold these lands to them during these treaties actually had no right to sell them at all. The Iroquois had conflict with neighboring tribes even prior to serious European presence in the area. Rather than fighting those enemy tribes, the Iroquois realized that it was easier to approach the British, claiming to be the mightiest confederacy around, ruler of the Ohio Valley tribes, their enemies, like the Shawnees, Mingos, Delawares, and Wyandots, and then offer to sell that land to the British. The British believed that the Iroquois owned that land and had sold it to them legally, and they happily moved to settle it. But in reality, tribes like the Shawnee had never been consulted. The Shawnee started fighting back immediately, but the British became wise to the tricks of the Iroquois. Rather than politely cede the land that they had bought from the Iroquois back to the Shawnee, the rightful owners, they used the documents of sale as a convenient excuse to continue settling the lands. The Shawnee fought valiantly and honorably in 1774, and that conflict became known as Dunmore's War, but the cards were stacked against them. The Iroquois leveraged their power to prevent other tribes from joining in, singling out the Shawnee, who took the full might of the still British Virginia militia, and suffered great losses. 
After Virginia's victory in the war, the Shawnees were compelled to accept the Ohio River as a southern boundary to their lands. So as more white colonists began to flood into the lands provisioned to them by the Fort Stanwix Treaty, the land south of the Ohio River, which the Shawnee had already been pushed off of, tensions spiked across all tribes, even the ones that the Iroquois had previously managed to keep from joining the Shawnee in their fight against the white man. By 1775, on the eve of the revolution, the frontier was on a hair trigger. Young native leaders like Blue Jacket agitated loudly to take up the tomahawk and strike back into the lands that were rightfully theirs, while older leaders tried desperately to restrain their young against open confrontation with the whites, which would surely mean death. There was a tense frontier neutrality that set in early in the war during 1776. Neither side wanted to devote resources to a campaign in the West. Wise chiefs were dismayed as their young warriors began to strike out across the Ohio into white settlements, despite orders not to. The blood was just too hot. In 1777, one wise old leader, Chief Cornstalk, determined that he would uphold his honor by formally riding to the white fort, Fort Randolph, located at Point Pleasant, West Virginia, to formally tell the commanding officer that he could no longer control his braves and that any agreement that they had made at Fort Stanwix was hereby off. Now, the commander responded by taking Cornstalk prisoner. He said, well, if we're suddenly at war with the Shawnees, and I'll take their chief captive. He didn't fully comprehend the honorable thing that Cornstalk was doing in giving him a proper warning. But later during that day, some hot-headed frontiersmen came back to the fort, men who had lost friends and brothers to Cornstalk and his braves not long before, during Dunmore's War, and those men murdered Cornstalk and the two ranking men that he had brought with him in cold blood. Now the Shawnee couldn't be held back. White men knew that tensions had been rising, and they feared that treatment laid forth by the Founding Fathers. They knew that they would be subjugated to an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. By late spring of 1776, fewer than 200 colonists remained in Kentucky, primarily at the fortified settlements of Boonesboro, Harrodsburg, and Logan Station. The Shawnee, now ready to just cut loose across the frontier and take scalps, were, as predicted, backed by the British. The British were, at the same time, looking for some diversion to cover the Saratoga campaign from Canada in a hot frontier full of, quote, merciless Indian savages, as Jefferson wrote in the Declaration, was the perfect diversion. What the tribes, primarily the Shawnee, didn't realize was that they were just a diversion. They would never get the full weight of the British Empire that they had hoped for. Ultimately, it was in Britain's best interest to keep the Shawnee weak, too. It's no good to have a sovereign nation of warriors in the middle of your empire. But the Americans didn't know that it was a diversion either, and even if the Shawnee didn't have British support, they would still be a terrifying foe. So the Virginians situated their frontier defense from three forts along the Ohio River, Fort Pitt, Fort Henry, and Fort Randolph, where Cornstalk had been killed. Problems at Fort Pitt would descend into what became known as the Squaw Campaign, a mess of fighting that resulted only in civilian casualties. Three men would defect from the American lines as a result of this failure. They were Simon Gurdy, an interpreter who had guided the Squaw Campaign, Matthew Elliott, a local trader, and Alexander McKee, future agent for the British Indian Department. All three would be tremendous assets to the British and their native allies. Two battles would be fought at Fort Henry, and Fort Randolph would endure a brief stalemate siege before being abandoned halfway through the war. The Kentucky settlers would desperately cling to their settlements there, too. Boonesboro, Harrodsburg, and Logan Station. Boonesboro would endure legendary attacks. During one, Simon Kenton famously saved Boone's life, in part by barreling over two native attackers by throwing Boone's unconscious body right into them. Harrodsburg housed many famous frontiersmen and would go on to be incorporated as a town that still stands there today. But it didn't see much direct action during the Revolution. And Logan Station was the site of a 13-day siege in the spring of 1777, during which Benjamin Logan, founder, ran out into a hailstorm of arrows to rescue a wounded settler using a feather mattress as a shield to absorb the incoming projectiles. Now, each of these frontier posts would continue to engage enemies. Make no mistake about it, men fought and died in the coming years of the war. But in the end, the war in the Northwest, in the words of historian David Curtis Skaggs Jr., ended in a stalemate. In the war's final years, each side could destroy enemy settlements but could not stay and hold the territory. For the Shawnees, the war was a loss. The Americans had successfully defended Kentucky and increased settlement there so that their hunting grounds were lost forever. Although the Indians had been pushed back from the Ohio River and were now settled primarily in the Lake Erie Basin, the Americans could not occupy the abandoned lands for fear of Indian raids. The stalemate had to come to an end. News of a pending peace treaty arrived late in 1782. 
In the final treaty, the Ohio country was signed away by Great Britain into the United States, even though not a single American soldier was north of the Ohio River when that land was signed away. Great Britain had not consulted the Native Americans in this peace process, and the tribes were nowhere mentioned in the treaty's terms. For them, the struggle would soon continue as the Northwest Indian War, although this time without the explicit support of the British. In short, the declaration brought on tremendous ramifications for those living along the frontier. While many frontiersmen might have shrugged their shoulders at the onset of the conflict and wondered how it would affect them, every man, woman, and child along the frontier would be hard-pressed to say that they had not witnessed some form of frontier brutality during the war, a direct cause of the declaration that was debated and signed by the Continental Congress right here. The frontier was the living, breathing result of politics. Every man lived the political decision when he shouldered his shot pouch for the day. Every woman lived it when they made do without flour or pins, and every child lived it when they fell asleep with terrifying images of Native American warriors or British soldiers dancing in their heads. It wasn't all bad all the time, but people did have to confront the conflict, and it was all because of a piece of paper signed right here at this building. As always, if you enjoyed this video or found it informative, please leave me a comment, a like, and consider subscribing to the channel. Thank you so much for watching.